Arn, let's jump into it. Last week, we set the table for this week's show talking about all the decisions that would lead us to the first thing we're going to talk about, and that's Jim Hurd's decision to fire the nature boy. Flair was a stalwart of the company, eventually the face of, of, uh, of all things Southern wrestling when you think about it. First under Jim Crockett Promotions, later as the champion for WCW. All that would change, my friend, on July 1st of 1991, when Jim Hurd fired Flair following a contract and booking dispute, uh, Jim had wanted Flair to sign a contract for three hundred and fifty thousand per year, effectively cutting his money and putting him in a financial position where he'd be making less money than Sting and Lex Luger, and dropping the world title with no build to Barry Windham. That was his plan. In an ad-free show's exclusive, Conrad Thompson sat down with Jim Hurd a couple of years ago. He discussed uh, the, his time at WCW, the decisions he made, his vision, regrets. And, Arn, you've never heard all of this interview, and neither have most of our fans, but we picked a couple pieces of this interview to play for our audience today exclusively. And uh, we're going to pick it up when Hurd and Conrad start talking about the turmoil between Rick and Hurd coming to a head over the contract dispute. And in our first clip of the week, it goes about 10 minutes. Uh, and uh, I'm going to play this in full because I think this is important for you. And I want to hear your reaction and why he fired Ric Flair. Here we go. Let's check it out. Well, talk to me about the, the Flair contract because it feels like that comes to a head in July. I think, uh, you know, he's wanting a, a new contract or to, to negotiate an extension. You guys want him to take a pay cut. You even tell him that, hey, we're going to put you in Baltimore and Los Angeles and we're going to put you in mixed tags. Uh, he's going to be teaming with Paulie Dangerously to take on Lex Luger and Missy Hyatt, mm. who at the time was being managed by Jason Hervey, which is probably a whole other story. Yeah. Uh, but ultimately, it comes to an impasse, and I think it becomes a bit of a, a shouting match about that belt, and he's relieved of his duties. That's and right. Talk to us about how it I got... took the belt, and I said, we own the belt. You don't own the belt. He said, I'm the champion. I own the belt. And I said, no, that's the belt. is the NWA's belt. And uh, so, you know, those things deteriorate into things that never happened or couldn't happen. And, and so he ends up at the Vince. Vince sees another opening, and he, and he does it. Talk to me about the decision to not just let Rick drop the belt. I mean, Great American Bash 91, the posters and the commercials were already out there. It's supposed to be Flair versus Luger and you want him to drop the belt. He doesn't want to. Mm. Uh, he wants a contract extension. You want him to take a pay cut. Mm. Eventually, it becomes just go drop the belt to Barry, and it just gets to a situation where he's not performing anymore at all. Mm. What was the reason for the divorce between World Championship Wrestling and Ric Flair? Did you ask him to take a pay cut, or were you just not willing to extend his current deal? I just started, I didn't want to get it to pay the same amount that I was paying uh, at the time because I was getting pressure uh, uh, as far as the money is coming in. And so, you know, the dynamics never change. In your opinion, was Flair justified to dig his heels in knowing that supposedly Lex Luger, who he helped effectively make a top star, was making 600000 Sting was supposedly making more than that. Why would he make half of what those guys that he helped make? He, Rick, uh, Luger never made more than 240. Okay. Never. Okay. So, you know, that, and so the difference between his contract and, and Rick's contract was huge. Okay. And uh, I, you know, you can, you can try to, you can try to make them all happy because mm -hmm. that's what you want to do. You want a happy group so that they will work together and do the same things that we felt we needed to do to uh, attract the kind of eyeballs we need from around the United States to, to, to fulfill Turner's ideas of what he wanted. And, and that's always in the back of your mind when you, when you work for Turner. Uh, he's not only a visionary, he's, he's brilliant, and, and you've got to always remember that he sets the rules, you abide by the rules, 
And wrestlers don't understand that. You know, I set the rules, and you as a wrestler abide by the rules. And Rick, uh, you know, Rick uh, just finally, it just wouldn't work with Turner with Turner's uh, uh, deal. How much of uh, that was was complicated by Flair's attorney, Dennis Guthrie? I read that you and he just did not get along at I all. I didn't like him from the day I saw first saw him uh, because he he lawyered me in coming through the door. Mm. And I said, you know, you guys, you may think you have all the, of the tools, but I'm telling you one thing. we, My guy behind me has got the tools, and that's cold cash. Ultimately, in hindsight, do you regret the way that whole thing happened with Flair? It does feel a bit like, pardon the language, a pissing contest. Well, yeah, I do. I, I You know, I always thought that Rick and I uh, were friends. And... and uh, Actually, it turned out that uh, I don't think Rick ever really liked me that much. So, you know, those things uh, have come to bear when you're negotiating uh, who's going to be the champion and who's going to wear the belt and who's going to get this much money. And all those things uh, come to the fore. And uh, whomever is in the middle between the ultimate monies and the guys here is going to take the brunt of all the uh, criticism. And that was me. Over the years, you've been criticized for trying to take the belt off of Rick and make other guys. I've always thought you had to try something because even when Flair was your top draw and was drawing big ratings, you're still losing money. So you haven't really found the solution. You needed to find your Hulk Hogan. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, younger fans just were not as attracted to Ric Flair as they were Hulk Hogan. No. So you yeah. rolled the dice with guys like Sting and Lex Luger, and it didn't work, but no. it was certainly worth a try since you were losing money, right? Well, we were we were up to a point, and then when when we decided to to decrease the number of shows we did out in auditoriums and arenas and all, we started making money, big time. And uh, it's called because we didn't have all the travel and all of the setting up and all the advertising and you know that goes with uh, performing uh, in a St. Louis or Keel Auditorium or uh, you know United Center in Chicago. You got a lot of of work to do. And um, once we, we decreased our presence out in that arena we started making money. Let's talk a little bit about um, Dusty Rhodes. Do you think Dusty Rhodes coming back and, and being on the booking committee is one of, one of the other things that was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back for Rick? Because those guys just did not get along in 1991. Well, right? I think, you know, number one, Dusty, at that point, uh, had lost a lot of the energy that, was, uh, that helped him become the star that he was. And then, as I said before, Dustin came on the show, came on the scene, his son, and there were a lot of, you know, he wanted to push his son, and, uh, and we felt he was, you know, hurting his own. And I can't, um, you know, blast a father for wanting his son to succeed, but he was Dustin, he was pushing Dustin to the point where he was hurting himself. Ultimately, it feels like uh, you made one last-ditch effort to try to salvage this relationship with Flair. I, I think you guys met with him at a Ritz-Carlton in Atlanta yeah. on July 8th and had everybody sort of sign an NDA saying they wouldn't talk about this. But you offered him a one-year contract for roughly $750,000. That's what's reported. But at that point, it felt like it was just too far gone. Why couldn't you salvage the relationship there? Well, because those are guys... Uh, you know, as I said earlier, their egos wouldn't allow you to settle anything. They they wanted to be the top guy, and they you know they both wanted to make the top money, and and, and at some point you got to decide which one do you want to go with. Let me ask when you when you met with him on July eighth, was that based out of 
you recognizing, hey, maybe, you know, we, we need to let cooler heads prevail and we overreacted. Or was it more, because it was written in the Observer at the time, I believe, that TBS legal had sort of forced you to try to make amends because technically you had no legal standing to fire him in the first place. Mm-mm. Um, was it you reconsidering or was it TBS saying, you need to go try to fix this? Well, I guess it was a little bit of both. I, you know, the, you're right, the TBS lawyers were, were nervous about law, you know, how you were going to be sued and, sure. and, you know, do who... It really, as you relate to the belt, who owns the belt? Right. The guy that won it fair and square, or if you, <laughs> you, you the circumstances surrounding the world's greatest lie right. <laughs> is hard for lawyers to digest. Arn, uh, probably the first time you saw that interview. What do you have any immediate thoughts as you watch that back for the first time? <clears throat> so his solution to fixing the issues was to cut everybody's money. And it seemed like to me, especially as we listened to the very opening, was Turner was saying, here's your pie. You need to make sure that everybody gets their slice. But but And, and, and so he's claiming, Jim Hurd's claiming... <clears throat> I had to make everybody fit within that pie. Everybody had to have their own slice. And so Rick wasn't happy with the slice that we kind of had for him. But I was just doing my job of what Turner wanted and kind of pushing the blame back to what Turner's expectations were. He was just the middleman. That's kind of how I saw him trying to explain what he was trying to accomplish. And he also then stated that Luger wasn't making 600. He was making 240. Uh, so that's a big difference in numbers, uh, from 600 to 240. So it's like, I don't know. I mean, do we know? Is it documented what Luger? So do, you just, believe, do you believe that? Do you ah, believe I Lex bet. was making 240? Listen, I, I'll give you some, some facts. Okay. Lex with Jim Crockett promotions, when he came in, there was sky high on him. Lex got a 350 per year. I don't know if it was times two or times three, uh, but that was the deal, 350, okay? That was with Jim Crockett. Now, if you think Lex is going to come in to WCW when he still has the WWF card to play and take over a hundred grand cut, I ain't buying that. No Based way. on what? Because one thing her did was made... It very clear that when he saw Sting and Luger and the Steiners, he saw the core of his company. And you know what? Good choices. Look at those guys. If you're building new superstars, those guys would have been a great group to start with a nucleus. But you don't cut your biggest star at the time, which was Ric Flair. Forget about the title. We're just talking about star power. You're going to cut his money. I think Rick was probably making for Crockett maybe six something. I'm just guessing now. Now you're right. going to cut him down to 330. Another thing, Rick, you know, said, well, you know, it was Rick put the deal together with Hurd for Tully and I to come back from WWF. Okay. They offered us 250 times three. Now, you're telling me now that went south when Tully, you know, was not brought back. And the quote to me was when I went in to sign my contract is we're going to be honest with you, Arne, we're not hiring Tully because of his legal issues. And we're going to cut your money over the three year period from 250 times three and make it 250 to or uh, two. Let's see, it was. 250, 200. No, it was three times 250. I'm sitting here. I'm so flipped. I'm just drawing a blank. It was three times 250 was my deal. Okay. Okay. And we're going to cut it 50 grand. So it went from 250 down to 200 per year. 200. Yep. And then what? 156, I guess, would have been the three years, right? Mm. 
So, so, so was it? Did they cut fifty? Did they go two hundred, then one, then one hundred and fifty, then one hundred? Like they scaled down fifty each no, year? No, it, it, I I kept one year at two hundred and fifty, okay. then two, then two hundred, then one hundred and fifty six. So it was a total of one hundred and fifty grand. It cost me. Ah, uh, I got over you. the three year period. Okay. Now you're you're telling me they're going to bring me in, and originally with my deal, and I'd be making more than Lex Luger. Yeah. Do you think that's a fact? No that's way. That's a bu- bullshit. There's no way that was going to happen. So there's another chink in the armor about telling, you know, lies. That, that Luger stuff. was making 240. Yeah. Yeah, that never happened. Yeah. You know, and uh, it's one of those things where when you're talking about cutting Flair's money from all oh, probably in half down to 350. And I want you to cut your hair and I want to call you Spartacus and put an earring in. Take the title from you, the whole thing. You know, take the title, cut your money. That was a, what kind of a beautiful offer was that? Rick had to be going, yeah, I'll take that deal. That's great. All right. That's one of the worst things I've ever heard. And f- listen, when Flair was the champion, that was one of the reasons back in 1988 of November that Ted Turner purchased WCW. It was Ric Flair as the champion and having him as the brand. Did you ever hear, you know, what Turner yes. actually thought of all this, this big dispute between his executive and the most important wrestler in WCW up to this point? I'm sure when Turner said, here's your pie, you slice it up any way you want, then that was probably the last conversation he had about that. I don't think it was something that he was monitoring every week or every month or whatever it is. You know what I mean? Yeah. So Jim Hurd should have been smart enough to go, okay, if I'm going to go Flair, Sting, the Steiners, Luger, that's going to be my core superstars. All right, slice that pile up to make their deals right first. Right. And then what's left, don't bring in a bunch of guys that you're never going to put on TV where they went south as they just kept hiring guys and, and they got to look at them and they never made TV. So they would get paid a year, sometimes two years of guaranteed money. You know, you get a, some guys that are making 100 grand a year times two, but never make TV. So where's the return on your investment? You know, that's more slices coming out of that pie. You had to be a little more savvy on who was worth what to even qualify to be able to slice that pile up, right? I got you. I'm with you. Yep. I mean, come on, since when, what made him, you know, the ding-dongs? Is that what made him qualified right. to slice that pile up? The one thing he did say is, okay, they quit running house shows. Well, those numbers that we had on last week's show that weren't very good is because hey, we hadn't built anything. We're a startup company. It was not built. We weren't doing anything. We weren't shooting the personal angles that would draw people into the arena. So the right thing was to not run house shows because here's here's the thing. Ted Turner bought the company, but we're a television company. So he was paying himself to put our product on TV. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because... He owned the. T- he, owned he, the, owned he, owned the, the he owned the company and the owned, TV channel. And the TV channel, yeah. He yeah. owned the, t- yeah. So he's paying himself. Well, that made sense to reel it in. Don't have all these expenses and plane tickets and rental cars and rent for the building and all those until you got a company built and you could do that just by doing it on TV. And that's eventually why they ended up, you know, uh, stabilizing and moving a lot of their TV shows when Bischoff came in down to, you know, whether they just shot in Florida or whether they just shot in Atlanta and just doing a lot of shows there. You know, The syndicated clip. shows in yes. Orlando, right? Yes. 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 Yeah. And when you could, you know, we had plenty of markets right around Atlanta you could run to do TV. Gainesville, Macon, you know, Dalton, Georgia, you know, Marietta. All kind of little towns that were just short drive back and forth, yep. uh, you know. And it was expenses that 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 they cut down, and I'm sure they did start to see some better returns on their investment. But of that clip I just saw, I don't believe any of it, other than that one part of it. That that's when we started to show 